This has been some great content. I think uh, I speak for those I've seen around nodding along that there's a lot of really good insights and especially hearing it from peer companies who have, who have been down some of this journey yourselves, which is uh, what we're really setting out to do with this event today. So um, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Doug Wyatt. I lead sales and marketing at Sparks IQ, um, but I secretly have a background leading sales enablement and training in manufacturing and distribution. So I have been the guy who had to support CRM rollouts, sales training adoption, uh, going back a number of years. And so I've, uh, I've been a practitioner and kind of helped guide some of that change in sales effectiveness myself from the inside. So um, hearing a lot of these things and some of the things that we'll hear from the panelists once we get mic'd up um, will be, I think, uh, you know, some things that will be very insightful. Um, you know, going back to Mike and Mike's presentation, we talked about the, the three columns, starting with strategy and eventually moving into tactics. And I think where, where we're going to get to uh, in this next section is going to be a little bit more tactical about the tools, the way you enable a sales team to actually go out and perform um, as, well as, as well as skills. So we've, we've talked and we've heard a lot about strategy, which has been uh, fantastic, and I think now we're gonna kind of take it one step further and get more specific about what it takes to actually drive sales effectiveness. So I'd like to invite up a few panelists, uh, Mr. James Howe from Motion, Bob Decker from Livingston and Haven, and James Gerties from Web Presented. So uh, James next to me here, I have two James, so I'm gonna try to do this carefully here. Uh, James got name checked a few times here already today um, as being very involved on, on the ground level and driving adoption um, at Motion. So um, James, why don't you talk a little bit about kind of you know a quick introduction of yourself and, and where you guys are sitting right now. Yeah, I'm James Howe. I'm the Executive Vice President for Motion and I'm over strategic <laughs> pricing. I'm over sales excellence our corporate accounts team, and our digital uh, offering as a sales channel. So all four of those work hand in hand together uh, to generate profitability and reinvest into the business in our sales transformation. That's right. And Bob Decker from Livingston Haven. Bob, you uh, lead the sales team down there. Why don't you talk a little bit about you guys? We're a smaller family owned company, so you know, not, not quite like a motion. Um, so we wear many hats, as James just described. So I am VP of sales, but I actually started out uh, to date myself with one of the big eight accounting firms. I'm a CPA, so numbers mean a lot to me. Ran my own family uh, corporation for 17 years and then merged in with l &H about 20 years ago. But through also this transformation due to COVID, uh, we have a value added a manufacturing side of the business and we run, I run several parts of that. So I learned a lot about the different parts of uh, Livingston Haven. And James uh, Gerties, James, I'm going to give you a hard time here on this panel because we have heard CRM uh, size, and, you know, and, and oh, CRM. <laughs> We've heard that a few times uh, in an unspoken way or sometimes a spoken way. So James actually is the uh, the president CEO at Web Presented, who is a uh, leading CRM provider for distribution specifically. So yeah. why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the efforts you've had, James? Yeah, thanks, Doug. Um, we make a little joke. We say we try to make CRM not a four-letter word. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, we're presented, we are the number one um, vertical CRM platform for distributors. We have over uh, 70,000 um, sales folks across the uh, US on only. Uh, we've got customers across the, the globe. Um, we provide solutions for distributors. We've been around for about 12 years, so we've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, of uh, distributors implementing CRMs, and i um, happy to share some of our, our stories. And, and, and we will absolutely get there, and I'm sure the audience will have some questions as well. Um, so I wanna start, uh, James, I'll start with, with you a little bit. Um, you know, and same question will go to Bob, but both of you guys have been in and around sales organizations and distribution for a long time. So this idea of sales effectiveness um, and actually being a little bit more intentional and proactive about driving it, what, what is different now than it was, say, 10, 15 years ago in that area for you guys? Well, one of the big differences di is digital. Uh, we were a sponsoring member at the uh, Texas A&M Digitizing the Salesforce Consortium, and combining the sales transformation with digital is something that's really accelerated. So um, our, the sellers have to work hand-in-hand -hand with any digital platform, and that means the pricing has to be right and accurate. The, 
the customer is going to digital first to learn information, and then they're coming back to digital for reorders and easy type of, of transactions and using the sales force for things that, as David would say, new, risky, or complex. So uh, our sales force needs to transform along with those platforms to work hand in hand. Our sellers get every day all the activity from their customers, what they do on our website. So they can, uh, they can combine what the customer's doing online with how they are presenting to the customers in person. And there's, there's really a, a new way of, of sales that, that really um, has accelerated through, through COVID. And then lastly, that, that virtual selling piece that we all saw over the last couple of years, we're going through a big change in making sure that our salespeople are not just okay at virtual selling, but that they're good at it and that they're confident and can use all the different platforms and can collaborate with our suppliers in, in that uh, virtual sales environment. It's, it's really uh, a new opportunity for added efficiency, more touch points with customers, and better close rates and growth rates. That's right. Bob, what about you? Sure, and congratulations to Motion on their 75th anniversary. This is LNH's 75th anniversary year also. And so how do you get to, to get there? You know, 15 or 20 years ago, we had the internet, we had cell phone, but it weren't near the distractions that they are today. Today we get hit by more things. You know, we, we can, I guess we could steal fax machine. I, I'm not sure where one is in our office. But, you know, you, you can text, you can email, you can, you can phone, you can do all these other things that my 26-year-old son does, but I'm not sure what they are. But, you know, it's harder to get a hold of people today than it was 15 or 20 years ago. 15 or 20 years ago, those folks would actually return a phone call. I don't know that people know how to re return phone calls anymore. But the last two years have just been a major transformation for us. We actually at LNH were able to, to sell you online in 1999. However, nobody got online to buy anything in 1999. Uh, so we have been in that business for, uh, um, for a number of years. How do we push more and more? I totally agree having your pricing uh, on your, your sys ERP system and online system is very, very critical. Uh, but teaching people how to do these virtual calls. They're not gonna go away. It may not be Zoom or, or Teams or whatever down the road, but it's going to be something. And how do we teach our sales folks and our sales team how we need to communicate? And one of the big things we're doing at l &H is how do we align with the buyer? It's not about our process. It's about what, who that buyer is and how do they want to buy? And let's make sure we give them that opportunity. But frankly, right now, having the right people, making these changes, all the things that we're doing at LNH with sales effectiveness, we find it easier to do today than it probably was two or three years ago. People are more willing to accept change because of all the change we had no choice but to go through here these last two years. People are, are our, our folks want leadership and they want guidance. How can they do, th do things going through this crazy world that we're in? And so we're, we're moving as fast as we can, but with patience. But in, in these days and times, we have to be able to move very efficiently. Uh, that's great. And so you, you both brought up the virtual selling and how <clears throat> disruptive that's been. I'm, I'm curious, looking ahead, you know, once the smoke clears from this thing, whenever that happens, we hope sooner than later, and we're not in a pandemic. What do you think, that, in you, both of your companies, what is the expectation of the sales force day to day in terms of balancing in-person activities as well as doing things virtually? What do you guys see in your companies? I'll, I'll go James first. I would say that it depends on the role that the customer's in. So the, the purchasing agents at customers, the corporate offices, they're very open to virtual selling and really have engaged it. When you're talking plant for, floor sales activities, and bring solutions at the plant level, that's still in person. It's always gonna be that way. They're still can send some videos and do some things, but our sellers are generally face-to-face -face in, that, in that piece. I think that it's gonna be here to stay and it's gonna continue to grow because it's more efficient and it's very effective. Yeah. Bob, are you seeing the same thing? Yeah, very, very similar. Uh, we're, we're, there's certain uh, of, our, of our customers, even the, the floor people, that virtual works just fine. Uh, maybe OEMs that uh, we're locked into for the next six or seven years with a, with a particular parts going onto the machine. But we also sell highly engineered systems. And we have to be in, 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 front of the, uh, in front of that machine to understand the whole process and how what we're trying to do is going to affect that process. 
But you know, we also have customers that come in and do runoffs. They, they, they see the, the large power units we build and they want to see it. They're not coming in and they're saying they're not coming in anymore, but they're finding out they can do that virtually just fine. Not a problem. So some things change, some things, most, a lot of things are changing, but some things are not changing. Yeah. One thing I'll add is it's difficult to build a new relationship in a virtual sense. It's yes. easier to maintain and, and to have touch points with customers you already know. But if you're trying to grow a new relationship, it's very difficult online to get the kind of connection that you can get in person. And our vendors don't understand that. They want to say, who are your new customers going to be this year? Well, we can't go see anybody, so we're not really sure. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. So, James, I've, I've led you alone long enough. You said <laughs> good, bad, and ugly of CRM adoption, and that we, we really wanted you to join this panel because uh, I, I think very few people have probably seen so many attempts, successful and unsuccessful, of really integrating a CRM in distribution as you have. So tell us a little bit about what, what is good, bad, and ugly, and, and what really separates the companies who do it well uh, and versus those that don't? Because I know a lot of companies probably are eyeing sales, sales tech you know, uh, as we look ahead and digitize more things. And um, I think we'd probably be curious to understand you know, your perspective on that. Sure. Um, I was listening to the, uh, the panel earlier, and I, I think it was Doug uh, Calhoun mentioned about um, their company transitioning from a sales-driven company to a management-driven company. Um, that really is the crux of, of whether a, an organization is ready for CRM. If they're ready to, frankly, confront the sales team, um, who typically have all the power, right? They own the relationships with customers. Um, if they walk away, there's a, a large threat to the organization. Um, they store contacts, communication history, opportunities in their own private little silo. Um, if the management is strong enough to, to take that on, um, to be able to provide uh, a level of value to that sales organization to say, you know, here's what's in it for you if you, if you are on board, if you buy into this CRM culture. Um, and so that has to be in alignment before technology can be introduced. It really doesn't matter what platform you put in place. If management isn't ready to take ownership, if management isn't ready to confront the sales organization to be a force of disruption, um, then that's really when, when the bad tends to happen. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, um, those who are ready to embrace technology understand that relationships still matter, but data is a critical component of decision making um, and optimization of efficiencies. Um, those are the, the organizations where we've seen very high success rates of CRM. So it's, uh, it's giving an, enough to the sales team rather than just asking them to do what they see as administrative tasks or um, just hand over their information to Big Brother and, and, and all of that. It's exactly. If, um, if any technology is, is more um, take rather than give, if, if we don't answer that what's in it for me question, um, and that's something that we do every every training session. We we say what's you know what's in it for you. Here's the reasons why. And and frankly, um, especially newer generations of of sales uh, account managers, sales reps are on board with it. You know they're used to entering information digitally somewhere. Uh, if it's in an efficient CRM platform that that makes their life easier, then it's it's a no-brainer. Um, and in fact, we've seen salespeople come to organizations that don't have a CRM and say, well, where's my CRM? Uh, so it's really a paradigm shift that we're, we're seeing um, as, as that kind of generational shift takes place. Yeah, that's, that actually brings up a good point. I alluded to earlier that I uh, kind of helped support a CRM role at a previous company, and that was exactly kind of what we found was the veteran sales reps were very hit or miss about adopting it, but the new people coming in, in some ways expected it, but also um, gravitated to it and just saw it as the way we do things around here. Yeah. And, oh, great, this is where I do this, because they haven't built up those old habits. So, you know, I think for, we've heard a couple times that, you know, a lot of industries are seeing this um, paradigm shift that's happening with the generational, you know, retirements coming up, and that's probably a, a good thing for that phenomenon <laughs> to be able to, to say, hey, if we get some, the right uh, processes and tools in place, it will work itself out. We probably can't win over the oldest old dog who sells the most. Um, but if we can get the, the rest of the culture bought in, I think Stu kind of alluded to this earlier, where you get the people who are um, doing the right things as up and coming people and growing faster, if they're the ones demonstrating what success looks like rather than the person with the biggest territory, you can get buy in that way, right? 
Yeah, I would say, um, let's say it, certainly that's correct, but it's also a, a slight um, mentality shift among, among management um, in that historically the performance of sales was measured by margin or, or revenues. And, and really, if you think about it, that's a, that's a trailing indicator. That's not really a, that's not really a determinant of what's going to happen in the future. Um, we've had customers where um, uh, salespeople have left their organization, and a month or two after they've left, they've had their best month of sales ever. <laughs> and so, you know, really, if you're if you're compensating, if you're um, if you're measuring success by by actual revenue or margin, then that's that's really not an indicator of what's coming. Whereas, if you think about success in terms of activities, the inputs that your sales team's doing, um, that's where you're gonna start predicting, um, affecting behaviors and then predicting future success. Absolutely. James, I wanna give you a, a moment because I know uh, Randy alluded to, you guys have, have rolled out your own system and Randy hesitated to call it a CRM. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about kind of, you know, some of the decisions that went into what that tool is and isn't? Well, the first thing we did was we looked at our sellers and there's some different personas within Motion. They're not all doing the same types of things. We have a corporate accounts group that has real contract lifecycle management type relationships. And then we have our specialists that uh, some of that group is actually using web presented in our, in our Bross company. And they're more uh, filling a funnel. It's engineering and project management. We have an inside sales team that's outbound calling, that's entering activities in based on, on that activity. And then we have these full line reps that are across the, the largest number of our sellers is our full line reps. And the, we decided to make our own app for that group of people that is, it has less, it's more collaborative, it's using data analytics to look at what are overdue SKUs, what, are, what customers are at risk, some of the common things, but a little bit less of the, of the extracting time from, the sale, from that group of salespeople. Our corp the adoption on our corporate accounts group and on our engineering and specialists will be very high, and there's a small number of seats, and the change management to do a traditional CRM implementation with those full line reps, we felt like that the juice wouldn't be worth the squeeze and the customized aspect of our app would be uh, a better investment. So, so that's, that's why we went that route. No, that's very good. And, and a little bit of that is right sizing the right tool for the job, in essence, because you, know, you realize that the day to day of that, the largest capacity group you had there, might not benefit as much from that long term relationship management. They're more, much more reactive in nature as right. far as what they do in day to day. And that's why it's such CRM light that we pretty much call it an app instead of CRM. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dirty word. We, we know. So, uh, Bob, you guys have uh, been doing a lot of effort to, uh, toward being strategic uh, about choosing your initiatives and as you think about you know, what sales effectiveness looks like at Livingston Haven. Can you talk a little bit about the process, you know, where, where you started, some of the things you guys have done, and, and looking ahead, what, you, what you're looking at getting to in the next couple of years? Sure. Uh, I, I can reiterate what Randy said about David Bowders, he can really make you feel bad some days when you don't realize you're, you're in trouble. Uh, I was invited to be on a, a, on a, with a group of distributors uh, a couple of years ago, right when COVID hit, and started down the sales process with Sparks IQ and thinking we're kind of fat, dumb, and happy. And very quickly we realized, oh, uh, we got some issues. I think one of the biggest opening uh, thing we did was we did, a, with, with Sparks IQ, did an assessment on our sales force. And it's something called OMG assessment, uh, which once it hit me, I said, I took this in 1998. It's changed a little bit, it's online, and it talks a little bit about some online sales, but other than that, it's the same. And as it came back to our sales, we reviewed, we looked, holy cow, our sales force is horrible. <laughs> They don't know how to sell. And you mean you want me to fire my top five sales reps? But then we got to thinking, our salesmen are, most of them are degreed engineers. They're problem solvers. They go out to that customer and they say, what is your problem? And they go out there and they solve that problem. And because they solve that problem and the customer says, you did, I want to give you money. They go, huh? I just solved the problem. So a sale just happens to occur with a lot of these engineers. And what we learned is we have never taught them about the selling process. 
And OMG gave us an overview of what our, where were we the worst. And it's the same place, I, I said I'm a CPA, but in 1998, they said, you don't know how to talk about money. I don't know how to talk about, I don't know how to talk about money to my customer. How you talk about what your budget looked like. It, and so those are very, very big insights that we got very quickly and then led us to other things as we continue down the path to improve our sales force effectiveness. And as our, our president says, you know, holy cow, we got to make changes. We're doing the same thing I did 40 years ago, which led us to, like they were talking about earlier, we have split our sales force into two different groups, uh, fluid power and megatronics. It lets them focus, take away the processes or take away the obstacles and improve the processes, whether it's a sales process or in our fact, we also had large internal process problems with our value add engineering. We've changed that. How do you take away those obstacles so they can focus on selling and not have to do the tactical stuff that we were talking about earlier? Yeah. Oh, that's great. And uh, so James, I know Randy probably stole some of your thunder here, but I want to give you the opportunity to talk a, a little bit more about um, the journey you guys have been on at Motion and, um, and maybe fill in some blanks that, that you, you think Randy left out. Well, we, we also did a sales assessment of our salespeople in each of those roles and we had similar results. It was, uh, we were terrible at qualifying. Our sales reps thought everything was urgent and would go out and be firemen to try to solve every problem. And, um, and there were a lot of really good insights about ways we could fix the process. Um, we did a customer assessment as well. Went to all of our corporate accounts and, and Indian River and Sparks IQ helped us with that. And we found out from our top customers exactly how valuable we were. And our negotiating stance uh, completely changed with our top customers because we realized that their corporate offices weren't always confident in their ability to drive the spend that they were committing to. And the more we probed about that, the more we found that the negotiation that we were having was a little different than what we had thought. So through that process, we, got a, we, we, we came back with what is our sales process? And we didn't, before these engagements, have any formalized sales process at all which makes it impossible to implement a CRM. We were just ready, you know, destined for failure if we had rushed out headstrong into, into CRM implementation. So between the customer piece and our own internal looking at, look at our salespeople, we had a much better view of, of where we were, you know, where we were headed. So um, as we, you know, we're still on this, this journey, we've, we've engaged in, in sales training with, with Sparks IQ with their Modern Sales Foundation to really focus our sales on the customer-centric, the buyer-centric view. So all of our sales reps are having the same types of conversations, which are what's important to the customer. It's not about us as salespeople, it's about what's the customer trying to achieve and how do we organize ourselves so that we're really good at helping the customer win so we can gather the business. So um, that's filling in some of the, no, some of the gaps there. No, that was good. And, and so I, what I'm hearing from, from both of you, I think, is um, some of what Mike and Mike talked about earlier, getting, getting answers, getting objective data to actually uh, be able to, to point your efforts because you, nobody has the bandwidth to tackle everything at once. We've, we've heard that today. But being able to identify where there are there a couple gaps and how do we solve each of these. You guys see that as just kind of a cultural thing that, that the company understands or is that something that really you're just, you're just hitting it from the sales leadership view? Uh, I think it's, get, it, about, it's getting through the entire organization, but one of the things that came out of this, both our own internal salespeople assessment and our customer assessment is, what does the, the great, the perfect sales rep look like within motion? Who is having success and what is their makeup and how do we duplicate that? How do we get the right people on the bus that have the right skills to win within motion with our internal people? And then which customers are we best at serving and where, which customers are we best at attacking to win with the customer Level. So we've, we've segmented our customers in a way that we know which segment is going to give us the highest return and that we're going to succeed with. And we've also segmented our salespeople in a way that when we're recruiting, we have a profile that we can actually send a questionnaire out to new recruits and say, this person is a pretty good match or isn't a very good match for, for our company culture and who's actually winning within motion. That's good. It goes back to what Randy was talking about with getting, you know, investing in A players and you know, if you're able to do that on the front end, long term, you're going to see that people bought into things like CRM, bought into the, the culture, bought into the role that they're asked to do. Um, well, you talked about sales process, though, but we helped, Spark IQ helped us to find a spark, uh, our, our sales process, but they helped us by saying, 
we need to bring more people in than just the sales folks. We've heard this from some other public folks. Our HR has been involved in the sales process. Our IT has been involved. Our operations, our inside sales. We've had input from everybody, and we've become moved away from being a sales team to an entire sales organization. Yeah, and I think we've heard that a little bit about mm -hmm. you know in, in any given company, everybody's in sales. It's just a matter of what your role is in, right. in that sales process. Um, so, James, I want to run back to you here. So. Um, you know, you, you mentioned earlier you've been doing this for 12 years. That's I think there's been a, probably a lot of change in sales tech, um, and and particularly in distribution in, in terms of looking to adopt. What are uh, distributors that you're talking to today looking for differently when they come to you for CRM than maybe they were 10, 12 years ago? Sure. Um, I think let's just take 10, 12 years ago. Um, the concept of putting data in the hands of of salespeople, basically democratizing data was, right. was a big concept. Um, e even to this day, some distributors are hesitant about providing sales information, margin information sure. to my route. What if they run away with that data? And I think that there's gradually over time, people have softened to that, to that idea that you, you're better off providing data so they can make decisions in the here and now versus worrying about what might happen sure. in the future. Um, but the the level of that data and the um, the type of data has changed a lot over the last 10 years. So rather than what we call kind of rear view mirror analytics, or what did this customer buy historically, um, and then assume that the salesperson is going to make a decision based off of that, uh, we try and provide, well, we've seen customers looking for more forward looking um, analytics. For example, what should this customer be purchasing that they're currently not purchasing? Right. Um, wh which customers should we focus on that we're currently not historically focusing on? Um, and artificial intelligence is a huge part of that. So in incorporating AI into, um, into any part of the sales process is, is simply is going to be the future. Sure. Um, and those who are adopting it now, um, getting comfortable with it now, we're we seeing that the ones that are going to be thriving in the future. Um, I will say, obviously, in terms of history, um, the pandemic's made a huge change in what people are looking for. Um, virtual selling is becoming important, so the ability to integrate with platforms like Zoom or Teams um, is now a, a given. Um, mobile messaging, text messaging is a, actually a, a much uh, rapidly growing mechanism that sales folks communicate with their customers. Um, it's actually a pretty intimate way of getting in with customers by sending text messages. Um, we've also seen many different case studies within the pandemic where um, the entire um, set of customer needs has changed because of situational circumstances. Like sure. we, for example, we have customers in the janitorial and cleaning supply industries that suddenly their, their sales and demand just <laughs> skyrocketed at the right place at the right time. Um, conversely, we've had customers in, for example, um, screen printing or graphics industries where um, you know, nobody goes to concerts or events or sports events anymore, and suddenly an industry is wiped out. So what we found is by those, those customers starting to realize if we could get as much data in, in the system as possible, it makes them more nimble, more agile to be able to adapt to the changing landscape. Um, and so, so we're seeing that, that recognition, uh, especially with COVID, has helped um, people realize if they were blindsided previously that access to data, making it actionable right. is critical. Yeah. And how do companies, when they adapt sales technology, you know, like yours, how do they, how are they generally measuring success? Because I, I don't feel like CRM today is a, we have to have that in mm -hmm. distribution. So there has to be, you know, some kind of scorecard to measure, like, is this working? Is this delivering the outcomes we're looking for? What, what does that look like typically? Yeah, so I think, um, I think there, first of all, has to be a trusting, trusting the system. So to commit to the fact that adoption of CRM equals success in and of itself and trusting that the outputs are going to um, pay dividends in the end. Um, so in terms of measures of success, I think the, um, the number of opportunities coming into the funnel, a number of quotes sent out through, uh, whether it be through CRM or through ERP system, sure. um, those kinds of leading, leading indicators I mentioned before are, are really what people are measuring yeah. in terms of CRM. Absolutely. So I have uh, one more question for all three of you because we've heard, I think, every single session has turned into a change management conversation. Right. 
So um, I want to give you each a crack at it too. So, so let's talk a little bit. Uh, we'll start with James here, and, and, and I'll hear from both of you. Um, what are some of the keys in your experience the last couple of years to really being able to see that change management be successful and not end up you know, standing up there and saying, we're going to do this crazy thing, and then immediately having to walk it back because the, uh, you know, everybody else overruled you? <laughs> what are some, some pieces of advice you have for the, the Well, I think change starts from the top. And it's really important to have uh, a, your top leader sponsor, whatever it is that you're trying to change, especially in a large organization. Um, it, communicate, communicate, communicate. I think that you can't communicate enough with, with any kind of change management initiative. We had a good practice run with pricing where we went through and completely changed all the day-to-day -day activities of all of our sellers with pricing. And as we're coming back through with our sales processes, and trying to go from the random acts of greatness to trying to democratize those good practices across the sales force. Um, we're we're have, using the same change management initiatives. And I think going from the top to that group of executive leaders down in the organization, and then there's another piece of people that I, that, a group of people that I call influencers. In our organization, there are certain people in certain places that influence other people. They're informal leaders. And when you go to try to do something new, people will call somebody. And that person that they call is either going to say, this is a great idea, James is really rocking, or they're going to say, oh, yeah, that's, that's the wrong thing. We don't want to do that. I'm just going to you know, slow play this. So identifying who those influencers are in your organization and getting them all bought in first uh, makes, a, makes a big difference. And they, was, they aren't always the people in the org chart as the leaders. And, um, and so I would, I would say that from what I've learned, that's one of the biggest things is getting those influencers to endorse the change management and taking that extra time with them to make sure that they feel like that you've, you've given them their due and they, they're bought in. Yeah. Bob? Uh, a little saying that I always like to say is that a bad culture will eat a good strategy for breakfast every day. And, and we've seen that at LNH over the, the years. 12 years ago, uh, we started implementing the SPA pricing structure, and we had a culture that says, we're going to fight this, and, and we know it'll go away because it's just the flavor of the day. And we were, were, were steadfast, and we moved forward. We had people quit. We had people threaten me. Um, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was, you know, it, it was hand-to-hand -hand combat. But 12 years later, we're very successful with our pricing program. So as we started implementing sales effectiveness, and we introduced the OMG tool, and then we got into a cadence of how we trained about how we needed to improve with, with, with OMG. They started seeing how it benefited them. And as you said, James, communicate, communicate. You cannot over-communicate why it's good for the company, but more important, why it's good for you. Uh, Mr. Salesperson, um, IT folks, whoever it may be. Um, and so as we continue and we have in introduced the uh, modern sales foundations, they're going, okay, what they've done so far has been very, very effective for us. It's, it, it's improved what we're doing. So we've built that, at the top leadership, we have built that foundation that they feel like what we're bringing to them is different than what we used to bring in the past. We're adopting sales training that is helping them move forward. But we have to be positive about it. We have to be honest about it, going, sometimes that was a good thing we just did, or ooh, we learned from that one. Uh, take the actions and, and make sure that you, you, you lay out what the change is and why the change. Communicate, talk about what we're seeing, ask for feedback, and one more thing, communicate. <laughs> James? Well, it's, it's hard to add too much to what you guys have said. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more with the, the top-down approach, um, lead by example, set the culture, define the culture, communicate. I think if there's one more thing I would like to add, um, it would be folks who have success in change management from our experience are the ones who know what success means in the first place. Measure, quantify, um, everything needs to be measurable. So if you can't measure it, then it, it's not right. It, it, can't, it has to be re, reinvented until you can measure a process or, um, or any type of effective um, strategy. Right. Um, so measurement is critical. And then um, make it make sense to everybody. Provide what's in it for me. Make it, make it um, mutually win-win. Uh, Absolutely. 
So we have a few minutes. Um, if anybody has a question for the panel, we'd love to uh, entertain it. Zero. We must have covered everything. <laughs> Not, not even a sarcastic question? Okay, I've got a question for, uh, for James. So, We've got to be a little more specific oh, with this. Right. <laughs> left, left James or right James? Okay. <laughs> so earlier on, the, the, I heard, don't go too fast, be transparent. I Ron mentioned that. And then you know, 20% tech, 80% change management, which we obviously beat that up pretty good. But Ray had talked about, you know, how quickly you guys went. I mean, you know, sitting back, I mean, is there any, is there any regrets or any unintended consequences there from a cultural perspective? I mean, would you rethink that? Do you think your, your pace was right on or? I think our pace was was right on. We moved as fast as the organization would move. You know, I, I think it's important to plan and make sure that when you're going, you're going in the right direction. But it's it's an S curve type thing. You push and push and push, and then the organization accepts change when it accepts it. And we did a we we did move pretty quickly, but we had done some prep work in 2018. And we had some pilots out there, some areas where we had done some things that we had proven that we, we knew we were going in the right direction. It was just at scale. And um, with Randy's support and with his communication, and then the executives all followed in with communication all the way down in the organization, it moved pretty quickly. And it is easier with new leadership to move quickly. So when you have a new CEO like Randy where everybody's a little bit they don't have predictability and certainty as to what it's gonna to be to resist. So the organization moved, I think, faster because we had a change at the top. But, um, but it, I, w I would say that if it took longer, uh, we would have taken whatever time it took to get there. Um, but we did, I did communicate that we can't be in digital without pricing. And therefore, we are gonna die if we don't do digital, we will be obsolete. So it was kind of a, we have to do it or we're obsolete. And, um, and so there was really no choice in, in conforming in the end. The organization uh, came forward pretty quickly. Um, and we're, we're pleased about that, but we're not done. We're still on a, uh, investing in this flywheel where we keep going back into the company with more investments that, that yield results that we can reinvest. And um, we, we're not even close to being at our optimal uh, capability for pricing or for sales excellence. There's a lot of opportunity for motion. Our goal is to be, since we acquire a lot of companies, the better we get this platform, David alluded to it, the more synergies we can apply to every company that's out there that we acquire. And it makes us that much better of an owner of that business because they come on and their growth rate goes up and their pricing goes up and their margins go up. Um, and they come onto our platform and become leaner and more efficient. So there's, there's a lot of upside to motion to getting this platform piece correct. Great question. Any others? All right. Well, in that case, I'd like to thank James, Bob, and James for, for joining us here today and having a great conversation. Thank you.